Okay, we're back. We're live. It's the one o'clock block. I'm, I'm here on Likeable Science. Here's where I am. I'm Jay Fidel. That's Ethan Allen. He's the heart of Likeable Science. And he's likable, but he's also a scientist. In fact, he's our chief scientist here at ThinkTech. Thanks, Welcome Jay. to your show, Ethan. <laughs> Glad to be here. <laughs> so we're going to do something uh, that's really interesting. And it's, it springs off a, an MIT uh, uh, newsletter article. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's all about the genome, but it's also about artificial intelligence and how it has helped us, how artificial intelligence has helped us look at not only the human genome, but other species not too far from humans. <laughs> <clears throat> and look at that ge genome and tell the relationship. It looks into heredity and descendancy, if you will, the evolution of the human species. Mm -hmm. We know more about it now than ever. So. What happened? What's the news story here? <laughs> well, the news story is that they, so a group applied very smart deep learning algorithms to examining a huge trove of data, modern human DNA data, ancestral human DNA data from old homo specimens, uh, Neanderthal data, uh, Denisovan data, which Denisovans are another line of like or, Neanderthal, but, like in another place in the world right. and in the, in the chain. Aust right, Australopithecine <clears throat> DNA, all kinds of different DNA. And, you know, these DNA records are incredibly sort of like, like giant code books. I mean, there's long strings of, mean, sort of meaningless strings of letters, which are coding for not only our 20,000 genes with several thousand of these letters making up each gene, but huge stretches in between the genes of what used to be called junk DNA, but is now recognized as being very important. It's DNA. not so junk after no, all. It's very, very important DNA. Yeah. And reading the stuff and finding patterns within it and finding where, which patterns look like what other patterns that you're seeing in these other groups. It's, it's a huge, mind-bogglingly complex task. And then matching that with what we know from bone structure, skull measurements, uh, uh, human migration patterns as revealed by archaeological evidence. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's sort it's, of multiple data sets we know, yeah. stacked on one another. And the bottom line is what they find out is that we not only have sort of the, the lineage we knew, our basic homo lineage, they found out some years ago we actually we carry Neanderthal DNA, which had for years we had thought we never did. Well, I think I know some of those people here on, <laughs> on, on Bishop Street. <laughs> we, we all carry some of it, and some maybe a little more than others. And then we all carry this Denisovian DNA, too. Uh, again, different groups carry different amounts of it. But it turns out that's not enough. The AI, the AI found there is still missing something else we are carrying. So there's some other ancestral group that we have not yet identified. Uh. There is some thought that it's a, that the other group is a hybrid of the Neanderthal and Denisovians who went off and formed their own special group for a while and then came back and, and interbred with humans. But that's a little speculative still. Hi. <laughs> it's mind boggling. Yeah. <clears throat> it's like a night in the museum because you get to see other species and you get to connect up, except it, it's not speculation anymore. Um, it's not based on 19th century science. <laughs> It's based on 21st century science. Yeah. So now we can confirm exactly how evolution worked. This is different yeah. than before. Yeah, it, it's a great way to look and, and see a refinement of the story. We used to tell this very sort of simple story of human, human evolution. You know, one branch out of Africa, one migration, da da da. And now it turns out, no, it's much more complicated. There was an, an early exodus that spread widely and developed in these other groups, a later exodus of actual our homo sapiens species have been for some while interbred with several of these other lines uh, and in various times and places and uh, before they all went extinct. Well, it's, it's thrilling, thrilling. Not only our survival, but, but their demise, <laughs> their extinction, as you said. So <clears throat> let's unpack some of that, though. Uh, you know, um, about six months ago, I went to a program offered by Kamehameha Schools and Ocean across the street. And it was a sort of combined program in the... Uh, in, in the facility that uh, Kamehameha Schools uh, has um, near the university. And there was a class, and there was a people, a very diverse group of people, including some judges, believe it or not, who were in this class. What? To learn artificial intelligence, to get a smattering of it, to, to see. And they had a, uh, actually a Japanese national uh, gave the program, and he got right into it. We all had computers, and we all learned the basics of artificial intelligence. 
And you know, if the one thing I carried away from that is a matter of comparing data, comparing images mostly in that class, right. and, and many and many applications of AI. Um, so you take you know you take uh, a bunch of images you and you say that uh, this is this is true about them or about one of them, and then you compare and you can see it's like facial recognition. You can see the face because it knows the face. Right. Uh, it's it's already done that, and, and it requires a lot of computing power. And it requires, uh, you know, a fair amount of sophisticated programming. Um, but fact is, um, you know, this is not all that complicated. Uh, it's the applications that, that are complicated. And that's what China is doing right now to apply it, you know, to various problems. Uh, so tell me how artificial intelligence works in the context you are describing, as far as we can go anyway. Well, let me, let me step back for a moment, if I might. Yeah, all, all human learning virtually all human learning can really be said to be pattern recognition. I mean, that's sort of what we start out being able to do is, you know, as an infant, you're distinguishing one shape from another, one color from another. You're, be, you're beginning to be able to group orange objects against blue objects or triangles against squares. I mean, this kind of thing, apples against oranges. You know, you're beginning to recognize there's people, there's men, there's women, there's boys, there's girls, right? There's bicycles, there's cars, there's motorcycles. I mean, you're, you're, these things all have their patterns that you're recognizing. And so we learn the universe around right, us. Right, exactly. And they've now taught computers to basically do that same kind of recognition, pattern recognition, on very sophisticated levels. And, and they look around, their universe is these monstrous data sets, these long strings of numbers or letters, or gazillions of images. Yeah, so it's not only patterns in terms of graphics, it's patterns, patterns in terms of data in general. Yeah, it can, it can be sequences of numbers or, or, or certainly patterns, right? Sequences of letters, words are patterns, you know? So it, it is, it's all, it's all sort of pattern recognition and how much you can ask it to match things very precisely or just sort of say your, your goal is to get Fuzzy. generally near, yeah. near to it. <laughs> and with that kind of thing, they now teach computers to teach themselves, to learn all kinds of things. They now have computers that can play multiple games, that can play Go and uh, chess and other games and play them better than people play them. Uh, and they've taught themselves. They haven't been taught and programmed to play these. They've actually played millions and millions of games against themselves and learned the patterns. Learn. That Every they, game they yeah. play, they learn. Right. And, and so yeah. what we have is recognition at a much higher level. We have learning, we have computers right. teaching each other. Right. What we don't have is awareness. We're at the lip right. of that, I think. And <laughs> it's not too far away. Right. But right. for now, it's, it's very sophisticated right. learning um, about the world around us and teaching other um, machines to learn about the world. So what is machine learning? Is that what we're talking about? That is, yeah. Those, those terms, machine learning, artificial intelligence, are often used somewhat interchangeably. Uh, People who are deeply in that field would probably argue those are two subtly different things, but uh, to me, they're pretty much the same. Yeah. But yeah, it, it, it's, a, it's a growing thing. And the applications, as you say, are enormous. We, we just had people a few weeks ago from Oceanit on. Oceanit has developed now a camera on a drone hooked up to artificial intelligence that can fly over a storm scene and tell whether telephone holes are upright or down and then report that back to the emergency crews so they'll know where to move, where to bring in, how much equipment, and how many crews so they can get oh, communications restored you know, yeah. quickly. Yeah. 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 And, and all it's based on, I mean, at a fundamental level, is a, you, have a, you have a pattern of a telephone pole upright, you have a pattern of a telephone pole down or partly yep. down, and it's going to be able to tell that yep. by comparing the, and, the and patterns. It, it gets, as they teach it initially with some clear examples and keep giving it fuzzier and fuzzier examples. and the, computer teases them out until it understands what that difference is and, you know, yeah. again, how, how to make a, a reasonable judgment on that. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. you may not get a perfect right. um, result, but you get a reasonable judgment, which is uh, no more nor less than what you can expect from a human being on, right. the, on the scene there. Right. And again, they use this now for uh, radiological, examining radiographs, you know, sure. human x-rays and all. Because I guess is that would be more accurate than yeah. a radiologist. Yes, yeah. it, because it's incredibly tedious work to look at image after image after image of these sort of gray scale images with little darker spots and lighter spots. Sure. You know, it's it, it's mind-bogglingly tedious, and but a machine doesn't get tired, and the machine says, does this match my image of a tumor? Yes, no, maybe. Yeah, and, and I mean, fast. Yeah, yeah, fast. And, and can run through a gazillion and, and of these. Based on so many samples, 
more samples than the, the radiologists could ever have available to them. More samples than all the radiologists in the country could look at in 100 years. <laughs> wow. wow. I mean, it changes uh, everything, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, exactly. And that's that's what, what this study did. So yeah. apply then the, you know, the notion of an artificial intelligence machine learning to what they did here to compare uh, the human genome with the genomes of these other species. Well, okay, I, I haven't thought about this in, in real depth, but basically it is like you had multiple sets of, of multi-volume encyclopedias all stacked around and one huge set for current human beings, one huge set for Neanderthals, and one huge set for Denisovians, huge set for Australopithecines, huge sets, and then other sets of encyclopedias for migration routes, other sets for comparison of bone structure, other sets of encyclopedias for skull structure. And this machine essentially read every single word in every one of those sets of diction of encyclopedias and said, oh, look at this, this piece of text here matches this piece of text here. I think these guys are pretty much more the same. And this doesn't quite match it, not quite as closely. So they're a little more distant from these guys. And, you come uh, up with a you come up yeah, with a judgment based right, they, they on built, testing all that. They built a, a tree of life, basically a human evolutionary tree, tree that, that that's co probably considerably more accurate than anything we've had to date. Yes. yes. Let, me, let me go back for a minute, though. So what we're looking at is um, the bones, uh, the composition of the bones. Uh, we're looking at the skull structure because that's important in all this. Mm -hmm. uh, and in fact, the MIT article had a picture of all the skulls of these related species, right. species related to human. Um, and then you're looking, I mean, we, are we looking at DNA? Are they able to extract DNA from some of these, uh, you know, prehistoric uh, bones and, and skulls? Yes. The, the, the first Denisovian, they found that they had one bone from the little finger, and they used a piece of that bone to essentially get the DNA and, and show that she was of a different species. She wasn't Neanderthal. She was not, she was not Homo sapiens. She was something else. And, and that was from a, a little core they drilled out of a single little finger bone, basically. You know, I saw a, uh, something on um, PBS or CNN not too long ago on cable about uh, a teenage Mexican girl, or found in Mexico, because you can't say Mexican, that was, you know, from thousands of years ago, who was alone and being chased by either animals or, or, or humans into a cave. And, she died in such as she fell and broke some bones when she fell and she died there on the spot. And luckily, uh, you know, these scientists were able to get her bones relatively intact after all the years. And they went back and looked and they did find DNA in old bones. Mm -hmm. They were able to do it. All right. And they were able to find out so much about this Mexican, I mean, this woman girl found in Mexico, her age, you know, her life history. Uh, what made her strong, what, what made her weak, how she spent her time. You know, that's the magic of science. You take the data and you evaluate everything you have and you come up with an analysis of all kinds of things that you wouldn't expect. Yes, I was just reading a fascinating analysis of, of uh, a woman who studies Mayan uh, skeletons and, and has developed this theory about the very sophisticated ritualistic sacrifice that the Mayan, Mayans did on, uh, based on, on subtle markings on bones that she, she has indicated a very highly sophisticated operator basically slicing people's chests you know, and being able to pull the still beating heart out, out of the chest. Uh, <laughs> wow. God knows yeah. what they did. <laughs> but yeah, they can now find DNA or markers of DNA uh, very, very old stuff, and they're constantly pushing that boundary back further and further and further. That's yeah, so, I mean, but that's just one vector. Right. So I go to the girl in Mexico, and I find um, some kind of DNA, you know, that much, just a little bit. Who knows how it survived all these years, you know, because chemical processes mm -hmm. of deterioration would, would kill it right. normally, but, you know, a confluence of events, and we have it. Right. And, um, okay, then you look at it and you look at the, you know, the biochemical composition of it at a molecular level, I guess, mm -hmm. and um, now, you, now you have some data. And really, we stop there, and then we bring in the artificial intelligence, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you compare that with other DNA you right. found elsewhere, right. and now you start to, you know, this is where the challenge really comes right. for the scientists. Right. What, how do you make something of this data? 
Right. You know? Exactly. These, these are literally just strings of letters or strings of numbers, depending on how you want to look at it. Just long, long, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands and millions of these strings of letters yeah. uh, together. And, and yeah, how do you start sorting through those? How do you break them up in meaningful patterns that sort of match our chromosomes? How do you then look at those and determine how much of it is how similar to another sample that you may have? Uh, what, what, are, what are you counting as similar? What are you counting as different? Yeah, uh, it, it's, it's really stunning stuff. And then, of course, match it to completely different kinds of data, too. You know? Sure. And, and one of the elements is carbon dating, which was so for the girl in Mexico. Mm -hmm. um, they want to find out when. When, mm -hmm. when did she die? Uh, and, and it's not just looking at the physical specimens they were able to pull out of her, um, but also uh, the carbon dating on how old those things were and, right. Right. and lock it in. And then you can start really developing an evolutionary pattern. Draw yeah. the chart. Right, yeah. And now there's all kinds of other dating, too. They can look at, at decay of very relatively rare elements that, that decay in certain ways over even longer periods than carbon-14 decays and get uh, extract timelines much further back now. Can we take a, a digression on that? And can you tell us how carbon dating works? So carbon dating works uh, off the fact that there are a number of different isotopes of carbon. Most of the carbon around us is so-called C12, carbon-12. It has 12 uh, protons, 12 neutrons, uh, or 6-6. Six, six. Uh, there is so-called carbon-13 and carbon-14 that have extra neutrons in their nucleus. Uh, Pricky C14 is a little bit unstable. It's, it's, it's a good molecule, it hangs to, or a good atom, it hangs together pretty well, but after a while, it tends to, like, one of those neutrons pops off and, and disappears. And that happens very predictably. Statistically, you know, there's a, a huge variation, but you, you, you look at a lot of those atoms together, and what you find is after about 5,700 years, there's about half the amount of carbon-14 in, in any sample than there had been when you, when you put it in there. Now, again, you're, you're talking about, you know, when you dealing with a little speck of material. They're talking literally about trying to count atoms, yeah, count atoms basically. <laughs> uh, so, and, so you can see carbon-14 can take you back, you know, some thousands and tens of thousands of years, but after a while, there's not going to be enough of it left to, to do the counting. Yeah, you know? yeah. But there, I would say there are other radioactive elements that have much longer half-lives than that, that have half-lives in the orders of 20,000 and 40,000 years. And so those now you can stretch things back hundreds and hundreds of thousands of years in terms of doing timelines. So uh, assuming you have enough material uh, and assuming you have, you know, the, the right equipment, which is expensive and, well, major, um, how accurate a reading can you get on that? Can you get it to one year, 10 years, 100 years, what? Um, I actually do not know off of using just one technology, but what, what now happens is that typically scientists apply a lot of different analyses to a thing. They'll look at the kinds of artifacts that are associated uh, with a given skeleton. And the archaeologists have built their own timelines of when these kinds of artifacts were built. They'll look at pollen records. And, and again, the climate records will tell you there should be more and less sure, of certain kinds sure, of pollen at certain sure. times. So they'll look at all this stuff together. And they can sometimes get this stuff quite, quite down to a, a relatively, relatively limited number of years. So you look at everything. Right. And, and, and let, me, let, me, let me say that uh, we're talking in the pronoun of, of a single person, but if you get machine learning to make this comparison of all these data vectors, so to speak, right. data con, you know, constituents, um, then you can probably do it better with, with more data and get a better result, right? You, you couldn't do it without, without the machines now. I mean, realistically, even when, when I was in graduate school, uh, a graduate student would spend their entire graduate career sequencing one part of one of the genes of the 20,000 genes of the human's gen genome. And now they can, they can run off a, a whole genome yeah. of a person in a few minutes. And you don't need that, that student. <laughs> no, no, you've got, you got a machine, machine that'll do, that'll do it. The right. student has to be off doing something right. more, more amazing yeah. <laughs> at a uh, higher level. But, but this is the beauty of it. Then you get all these multiple data sets, and, and data sets that are very hard to compare. It is, it's an apples and oranges kind of data. It's building the spreadsheet. It's right. building the fields. It's, it's comparing the fields. Right. It's, as they said in, the, in this Nature article, it's not just saying X and Y and here's a line. 
there's a thousand dimensions and you're making some squiggly pattern that connects these thousand dimensions in some reasonable way, you know, right. and, and it's, it's, it, it is, it's mind-boggling and complex. Right, right. You know? But the more we can get machines to do this, you know, the less mind-boggling it is and the higher we can go on the, on the thought change, right. thought chain. Um, but I want to unpack one more thing. You mentioned in that stream of vectors, uh, geographical location, which mm -hmm. I mean, you know, we know that uh, humankind, uh, at least the Homo sapiens species, uh, came out of the East Rift Valley in Africa and East Africa. Um, and it went from there, and they have maps. You can open any any book and find not any book, right. but many right. books. Right. You can find maps of how you know the species traveled over I don't know 120,000 right. years or right. something like that, all around the world. It populated the same genome everywhere, um, and that's really interesting because um, because the the evolution of the species depended in substantial part on the environment. Uh, humankind has a relationship with the environment. It, it tests us, mm -hmm. and the survival uh, of the fittest is based against the survival of the fittest in that particular environment, right? Right, right absolutely. So tell me how they get the data, um, the geographical data you were talking about, as an element of this analysis. So again, uh, different groups of scientists have been looking at different aspects. So there are scientists who study uh, the ecology of different regions of the Earth, and, and it's paleoecology. It's looking back at the ecology a long, long time ago. So they will, for instance, drill cores of mud out of lakes, and, and they will look at the layers of mud, and it turns out layers of mud are very much like tree rings, uh, particularly in temperate climates. Different things fall in different seasons. They pack down in, in very neat, orderly se sequences. And again, by, by getting into one of those layers and starting to pull apart what's in that layer, what are the shapes and kinds and patterns of the pollen grains? Are these grass pollens or are they tree pollens? You know, you can begin to infer, was it warmer or was it colder? Was it wetter or was it drier? Was there more thing, you know, more here? Uh, you, you get little parts of insect exoskeletons in that. And again, from those they can tell, was this a, a dry land or, or was it a swamp? Uh, so again, you've got that kind of data that can tell you a great deal about the environment. So. Uh, and Once you know about the environment, you know about the challenges that the species uh, had in that environment. Right. And you can get a beat on how that might have changed the evolution over thousands of years. You know? Right. If you were stronger, taller, if you were capable of dealing with cold weather or warm right. or disease and all that, and, and, and so that would be a function of your environment. Exactly. And gee, God, you know, that actually opens the whole door to climate change and how climate change might affect evolution. But let's not go there yet. Let's have a break, okay? okay. That's Ethan Allen. He's our likable scientist here on Likable Science. And he's our chief scientist, and he knows a lot of stuff. And, and you know, what I'd like to do when we come back from this break, Ethan, is examine what, what, in fact, we have learned about the greater processes of evolution from then till now, and what, if anything, we can infer and how logically, scientifically, we can infer it going forward on evolution to follow. Oh, exciting. All I'll right. be right back. <laughs> hey, aloha. My name is Andrew Lanning. I'm the host of Security Matters Hawaii, airing every Wednesday here on Think Tech Hawaii, live from the studios. I'll bring you guests. I'll bring you information about the things in security that matter to keeping you safe, your coworkers safe, your family safe, to keep our community safe. Uh, we want to teach you about those things in our industry that you know may be a little outside of your experience. So please join me because security matters. Aloha. Okay, we're back with Ethan Allen, our likable scientist here on Likable Science. <clears throat> so Ethan, you know, I'm trying to make sense out of this, and it's a big question. I don't know if it was covered. I really wonder that it was covered in the uh, MIT article. But what, what have we learned? What can we learn? Why should we care, really? Because you know, these sound like profound scientific experiments and, mm -hmm. and findings, but at a very scientific database level. Um, what, what larger picture can we get about the evolution of the species, or all species? The evolution mm -hmm. of all species on the planet from learning about the connection of the Homo, Homo, Homo sapien and these various other contributing species. Well, I mean, for one, you can, you can look at this and say and ask a simple question. So why is it that we have retained certain Neanderthal genes? What, what value have those genes brought to our species? 
what good did they do the people who, who possessed them that enabled those people to reproduce and keep keep that gene in in the germline you know and what what other genes didn't make it uh, what did those genes do and yes they are now actually just beginning that line of investigation trying to find out what that Neanderthal DNA does when those genes get turned on in, in, in our development. And some of it has to do with aging processes, they already Ooh. know that. Some of it may have to do with, with some brain development. Uh, th this is, they're just sort of scratching the surface of this whole, uh, this whole area now. Uh, but it's the kind of thing that, yes, you can learn a whole lot about, because genes are sort of expensive. Uh, they're, they're biochemically costly to make and to maintain. And if they're not good, they rapidly get dumped out. The, the, the people who possess them don't reproduce. If that's that's ultimate marker of a bad gene, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and conversely, the marker of a good gene is you, you've produced lots, lo, lo, lots of descendants, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, assumedly, the genome that we have today is uh, represents pretty good genes. You know, uh, that it's, it's scavenged from other species, as it were, which is really an interesting idea if you think about it. We don't often think of ourselves as, as stealing genes or borrowing genes from other species, but we, we now know we have done this in the past. Yeah. Uh, the second part of your question, of course, is much tougher, is where, where does this take us? Because we have now a, you know, a biological evolution that is proceeding along and has always proceeded. To, to perfect what, what, the species well, within yeah, the environment. Well, right. And if the environment is changing, changing, that makes it all the more complicated. Right. So it's, Bio biological evolution is never going to have, is never going to hit perfection, right? Because the environment is changing, but it's always going to track the environment in some sense and try to match it. Yeah. But now we have an environment, a physical environment that's changing much more rapidly than it ever has before. We have a cultural environment and we have a technological environment that all of which can influence the genes. Uh, we're, and we're now able to go back and start actually manipulating the genes due to our technology and our culture. Right, and, and literally physically manipulating the genes. We, we talked a while ago about the, the CRISPR babies that have been born, the, the, the genetically modified human beings that have, yeah. have been born. Yeah. So, and, so your, your question about where this might take us, I mean, that... It's, uh, it's really unanswerable. Yeah, yeah. That's, there are too many variables, right. even for machine learning, I think. <laughs> there because we go. one is, we, you know, we don't know the effect of climate change, and that's a study all in itself. Right. So you can't throw any assumptions in. You can only say it's going to change and dramatically and more quickly than before. Secondly, the, the, the species itself has the technology to change the genes. And uh, not only the genes in one generation, but the genes going forward. We can, we can modify ourselves and our progeny. Right. That's pretty scary. We can do a good job right. or maybe not. Right. And that's un, unpredictable also. All right. So I was just reading a fascinating article about, about honeybees and honeybees in hot weather have to stand in the entrance to the hive and fan to get cool air going through but it turns out they're not doing this sort of randomly they are standing in the hottest places of the entry of a narrow entryway and fanning there and not in the cooler places and, and purposely sort of setting up a good draft flow furthermore different bees have different thermostats for that that behavior so that as a colony they can, even in cooler weather, you'll still get some bees doing it. In hotter weather, you'll get different sets, maybe more bees doing it. In very hot weather, maybe a whole bunch of bees will be doing this. It's, so yes, in some sense, as the temperature, the global temperature rises, will we decide at some point, we better start manipulating our genes to be more thermally tolerant uh, or tougher to be able to withstand flooding or, you know, or, or whatever, you know, what traits we, we, we want to pick. And that, that gets to be a very interesting kind of scenario, right? Challenging and scary. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah I the, mean, it's one thing to go in and fix a, a, gen, a genetic problem. Somebody has a genetic defect that you can go in and fix early on and let them live a relatively normal life. That's grand. And virtually no one will argue that's, a, that's allowable. But it's but, not that simple. Right, no. <laughs> and once, yeah, and who, who gets to have this technology? How do we decide who to use it with? Maybe a machine learning, artificial intelligence can look into the future and crank all these variables together somehow and make them some speculative, um, you know, expectations and guesses and whatnot, and tell us about the future of the of the human race. 
<clears throat> I, w I, I don't think I want to know right now. <laughs> it's too scary. It is. It, 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 it's a little frightening to look at. <laughs> Thank you, Ethan. Yes, indeed. Great okay. to talk to you, as always. As always, right. Aloha.